I am Alex Kack, and I'm joined today by Jeremy Goldcorn. Uh, Jeremy. Hi, Alex. Welcome Thanks to the for show. having me on. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, I've been, uh, the last couple of weeks, um, kind of uh, having to ask this first question up front, but, uh, you know, are you okay? Is everyone uh, over there safe? Is the family doing okay? Yeah, I'm pretty good. I mean, uh, I've been working remotely uh, ever since I moved to the United States five years ago. Uh, and we live kind of in the woods west of Nashville. So aside from having my kids at home, not too much has changed and all of us are healthy. So I, I can't complain. Well, I'm grateful to hear it. Um, it is it is a weird thing. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's kind of hanging over the entire world right now. And it, it would be remiss not to ask something about it, or at least to make sure that, you know, you're Absolutely. doing all right. Um, so you are currently the editor of China uh, News. Is that, uh, that is still correct? correct? Has it, yeah. That hasn't changed in the last 24 hours. No, that hasn't changed. I've been doing that for uh, since 2016. So, and nothing's changed <laughs> yet. <laughs> let's talk, uh, let's, Let's talk about, um, so first off, can you explain what SubChina is? Sure, <coughs> excuse me. It's a website um, about China, um, all kinds of news about China from business to society and culture and politics. We also have a number of podcasts, uh, all with a China theme and a daily newsletter that uh, people pay a subscription for. So it's aimed at anyone who wants to stay informed about what's going on in China. Um, so I, you know, I subscribe to the daily newsletter, um, and it uh, since I have, it's actually it's just been incredible the amount of information that I realized I was just completely missing out on. Um, so how how did this kind of a uh, website first come to be? What was do you are, what was the kind of a conceptualization of it, and and how do you think it's changed the news space in regards to reporting on China? Well, um, it's. I should say that I've been doing similar things for most of my working life. Uh, I used to have a website called Dunway, which I ended up selling to another company, and it's it's now defunct, but it was similar in some ways. But SubChina was started by uh, a woman named Ang La Cheng, uh, who is American Chinese, uh, with the idea of informing people about China, better informing people in the United States about China. And it was initially just a daily free newsletter. Uh, but since it launched in 2016, I joined shortly after the launch. We've developed, um, you know, all, all of these other uh, media features. Um, so some of them predate it. The, one of the podcasts is called Seneca, and uh, I have been doing that with uh, my friend Kaiser Guo since 2010 when we used to live in China together. Um, and uh, when we joined SubChina, we brought the podcast on board with us. Um, has it changed the media space about China? Uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, I, I think we are having an effect on a lot of the reporting that you see because we often see stuff that we cover, um, you know, later get covered in uh, the mainstream in the in the establishment media uh, a, a day or two after we've done it. Um, but you know, the current media environment is just. I mean, there's so much media. I I, I don't know if we've actually changed it yet <laughs> but maybe that's our aim well i think uh you know there is there's a very specific what kind of lens of focus that you guys exist exist in uh that is as media dedicated to china yeah. um obviously china is a huge country they're they're a world superpower but why don't we see the same level of focus on uh, other nations in your opinion yeah, that, that's a very good question. I mean, I often wonder why they're, they're because we're not the only China focused website, you know, there, there are nonprofits uh, doing uh, similar things like the Asia Society. And of course, there's a lot of investor interest in China. So there's a lot of business and financial specialist information services. I think the, the money is one part of it. You know, the business interest in, in China is probably greater than any other country. Um, but it, it's, it is odd that there are, you know, there isn't a similar website really in English about Russia or India, say. Uh, India, maybe it's more understandable because there's already a great deal of 
uh, content in English, uh, you know, often produced in India. Um, uh, Russia, you know, it's kind of strange that I, I, I'm not aware of, uh, uh, or at least there are not a ton of sites that that focus on this. Um, I, I would say, aside from the economic reason that just China is so, you know, economically important, there is perhaps another reason that I mean, a lot of people like me have spent most of their working lives uh, and often uh, their studies involved with the country. Um, and it's uh, it's fascinating. It's deeply fascinating. It takes a long time to really get to understand it, I think. Um, and therefore, I think we feel the need to uh, try and explain it. And I think there is a, an appetite for people um, to uh, to understand in a more specialized way than you'd get from a general uh, media, so a general news uh, media. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not, I, I mean, there should be similar operations doing India, doing Indonesia, Russia, you know, if not individual countries in South America, you'd think there'd be something similar about Latin America and English. It, it is interesting. I mean, I mean, there are, obviously there are, you know, blogs and, 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 and smaller newsletters that exist, but they haven't had the level of success, uh, I think either, um, to to kind of dedicate and focus in the way that you guys have, for example, or that that numerous of these uh, websites featuring China have, and, yeah. and it is something that I've I've always noted noted and found odd. Uh, there is almost this like self perpetuating cycle where it's um, you know nations and their their kind of uh, you know these emerging economies. I feel like are are no different than anyone else in a, in, in a sense of uh, you know you get investment. Through the media cycle, almost through media attention, and then one feeds the other. Yeah, it's bizarre to watch how that hasn't, yeah, that how that hasn't translated better um, into Western media. The, uh, um, yeah, it's, you, you it's, know, you it's the investment. That, I guess it's also, um, you know, I think the West and particularly America is alternatively, uh, alternately fascinated and horrified by China. And that, that, I think, is certainly a reason for it as well. And right now, you know, there's uh, some very stark divisions in some ways in the what you might call the China-watching community, where uh, there's a lot of people who perhaps even used to be quite sympathetic to China, but are, are, are very, very sort of uh, hostile towards the People's Republic right now. Um, and then you have a bunch of other people who are desperately trying to, you know, encourage better relations between the US and China and in the current environment generally failing. Well, you know, it has been an interesting kind of a uh, year and a half uh, for how China has been perceived in the West, because I mean, you had the, the issue with the Uyghurs and then now you've got the issue with global pandemic originating there. Mm. Um, you know, how, how do you think this has changed, you know, those two things have changed perception or at least changed the way that you guys are reporting? Um, is there still room to focus on, on other stories and issues? And, and what do you see kind of coming out of the West in response to these things? I mean, for us, there is because, you know, we're fairly specialized. But I, I think the, the internment camps, you know, that have detained more than a million Uyghurs, as far as we know, and other Muslim minority groups, they have um, really put a lot of people off China in a way that even previous um, crackdowns on dissidents and kind of nasty behavior from the Communist Party didn't quite succeed in doing. Um, you know, and I, I think a lot of it is because people sort of feel like, you know, we said never again about the Holocaust and now there's millions of people in, you know, what are concentration camps. Um, and I, I think this has in some ways done permanent damage uh, or at least long lasting damage to, to China's image in the West. Um, although not so much in Muslim countries, funnily enough, uh, but um, certainly I, in the West, I, I, I think the COVID-19 pandemic is going to have a similar effect despite China's best attempts to spin it and now you know going around the world offering aid and medical uh you know doctors and uh medical equipment and stuff like that 
I think there's a lot of bad feeling about China and their early missteps in the days, you know, when it was still confined to China. And I don't think those feelings are going to go away anytime soon. And I think politicians, I mean, particularly um, Donald Trump, of course, is going to uh, use China as an excuse for uh, his own failings. And I, I think you'll see that repeated in many, many other countries. So I don't, you know, I, I think it's going to be some rough times internationally between China and a lot of Western countries. It is, it does often, I think, feel like this impossible scenario uh, where China is is constantly engaged in these kind of human rights abuses, and yet they are so central to the world economy and so powerful, uh, you know, militarily, frankly, that it, it, you you almost don't really want to do anything to kind of you, you don't want to you know poke that bear so to speak um, mm. because it could create so much further disruption or such a, such a worse scenario than what's already happening. But how how does the international community respond to something like what's going on uh, through your um, concentration camps um, or or any you know I mean we saw this with uh, the Falun Gong was obviously a prevalent one uh, some decades ago. I mean you know one kind of group after another, uh, how do we respond to this? You know, that's a very good how question. How should, should anyone respond? Uh, I, you know, I don't know. That, that, that is a very good question. Uh, you know, for many years, I think uh, a lot of people in the West, including to an extent myself, believed that further engagement would probably open China up a little bit more and improve the human rights situation. But that absolutely hasn't happened. And in fact, you know, since Xi Jinping became uh, top leader, quite the reverse. Um, I, I think the, the one thing that I do know is that, um, you know, such abuses should be uh, relentlessly reported on and exposed. Um, and I mean, as a, you know, media person, I mean, that's the thing that I, I, I can do. Um, I, but aside from that, you know, for many countries, it's, it's not realistic to put sanctions on China, even for the United States. Um, and it's not just trading relationships, uh, you know, things like dealing with COVID-19 properly really should require international co cooperation. Um, so I, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Um, I do think though that the, um, it's very important that uh, all these abuses are documented properly and that the world isn't allowed to forget them. It is something that I mean, you know, you you mentioned Xi Jinping, kind of his role and how he in human rights abuses, and I feel like you know if you it, when you look back at reporting from when he first elevated the power, that felt like it very much the opposite. It, it seemed like you know, especially with his family legacy being one that was kind of, um, you know, his family's role in the communist revolution was kind of based in the, as the concept of trying to make sure that human rights, I feel like, still had a seat at the table. Um, that has not been what we've seen. Hmm. Did, did that factor into how the international community responded to him, both initially and, and thus far? I think it did. I mean, you know, his, his father was, I suppose, about as liberal as you could get for that era of Chinese communist. Uh, but he was certainly perceived as, um, you know, a reasonable man who was not, did not have, autocratic tendencies. And so a lot of people did indeed believe that she would be some kind of a reformer. Um, Nicholas Kristof, the New York Times columnist, famously wrote a, a column uh, when she uh, uh, had just been uh, announced president and party leader, predicting that Mao's body would be taken out of Tiananmen Square and that the famous dissident Liu Xiaobo would be uh, released from prison and this kind of thing. And of course, Liu Xiaobo then died of cancer in prison and Mao's body is still very much in Tiananmen Square. And now we have Uyghurs in concentration camps and all kinds of repression of civil society and media. Uh, so I, I think a lot of people did misread, uh, misread Xi uh, at the beginning. And uh, it took a few years for uh, most observers to actually realize that this wasn't going to be um, all bubbles and flowers and that this guy is a, uh, 
a, a real authoritarian. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned Mao, and I mean it's hard to talk about China without without looking at kind of Mao's shadow over over modern Chinese history. Mao was incredibly autocratic uh, as well, but an authoritarian. But it seems like for two very different ends than what we see in China now. I mean, how how is that evolution taking place? I mean, where do you still see a direct connection between you know the revolution under Mao and his government to what we see in China now, or is this kind of a completely new evolved government? No, I think there's still a connection. I mean, uh, you know, the the what the communists would call the external situation is very different. The world is very different. But I, I think, you know, for Mao, communism was uh, 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 one part of a quest to restore the greatness of the Chinese nation. And I think she very much has that same, uh, explicitly has the same goal. Um, and I think the other thing that is 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 continuous is this Leninist political system where control is uh, control is is supreme, and where democracy uh, and liberal values are seen as a tool of a hostile class, whether they be one's own bourgeoisie or one's own you know exploitative upper classes or the evil American imperialists, that um, liberal values are you know anathema to uh, a, a party that is wise enough to lead the people for for the betterment of the people. So I, I think those things are very much in common. Um, I mean, what's obviously very different is that there is a functioning market economy. It's a very um, different market economy from the United States and Western Europe, but there is a market. The state plays an enormous role in it, though. Yeah, it is. I mean, the the economic system that China's developed does seem so far removed from Marxism in so so many ways. Um, I mean, you have billionaires, you have Chinese billionaires, you have some of the largest privately held firms uh, in the world uh, out of China, and and I mean, we you see these abuses. That are that are no different. I mean, we we what was this? Uh, was it which tech which technology company where the uh, was like the CEO or the CFO was just outed as a pedophile in China recently and has kind yeah. of been trying to hide behind a cloud of money that's very reminiscent of Jeffrey Epstein. And so it, it is interesting, I think, especially when and you, you have a, kind an of exploited uh, leftist, working class. You know, um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, that's true, which is why I tend to think of Lenin as being more important in understanding the Chinese Communist Party than Marx, because their, their aim doesn't, uh, you know, Xi Jinping talks about poverty alleviation a lot, and there certainly is a very real attempt to lift everyone in the country out of poverty, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not a it's no longer a party that seeks to destroy the rich, but it uses Leninist tools of control to ensure that it still controls the party. So I would say, you know, they're, they're heirs to Lenin rather than Marx. It is, it is an interesting thing. I mean, you know, and I think that that's kind of one of the big almost arguments that, that, you, you know, you, you get in, in Western society, is, is, is it fair to truly call China communist at this point? I mean, they obviously still refer to it as the Communist Party. But, yeah. but is, that, is that truly a fair interpretation, do you think? You know, I, I, I think uh, if you think of communism as uh, a situation where wealth is equally distributed, clearly that's not. But if you think of communism as a bunch of tools that you use to control society and end up with certain, uh, you know, to achieve certain ends, I, th I think it still it still works as a term. It's, you know, I mean, that's an interesting point, I feel like almost unto itself, because it's, it's more communism as Ronald Reagan would refer to it than communism as I think a lot of you know, early communist writers, for example, would have referred to it. I think the, the mm. goals are drastically different and the, and the way that it looks is very different. I think that's right. And I mean, you do see, um, you know, last year there were, uh, and the year before, um, a number of uh, Marxist student 
associations in China, which were going down to factories, mostly in the south, in the south of China, where most of the factories are. And, you know, they're acting as labor activists. And they were all arrested or intimidated into silence. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. It, it, it To me, it seems like an important distinction almost that gets missed, and I think in Western understanding of them, because it's it's very easy to soundbite down, uh, I think especially post-Cold War, to, to soundbite down and say, oh, you know, like, like communism bad, but it, it leaves out very fundamental understandings of like political ideology, I think, for the average media consumer. Mm. And I think that can be very dangerous as it starts, as you start to talk about different economic models, different systems of welfare and distribution. And uh, and then also, I mean, I think really understanding the motivations of China um, and how they fit into this kind of global market. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you sense. mentioned the American imperialists earlier. And mm. but, you know, when we see we see some of the, the actions that China takes and kind of creating a sphere of influence, that to me is very reminiscent of old school imperialism. It's just a far more clever way to do it you know yeah. they're not they're not outright politically colonizing those places they are they are lifting them up in many ways but they're making them incredibly dependent on them in the same yeah. way i i think that's very true it, it, it's um I, I you know i suppose it depends how you define empire but they are building uh resources all over the world uh they are not exactly subjugating other countries but they are pulling, uh, as you say, other countries into their sphere of influence and sometimes pulling them in so close that the countries no longer have much of a choice about it. So it, it, it is, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is one of Xi Jinping's, uh, you know, signature projects. And that's essentially what we're talking about is this massive infrastructure uh, and transport network that they're trying to develop that will connect China to the rest of Asia and Africa and Europe and beyond to, to the Americas and give China uh, a bigger say in global affairs as well as, uh, you know, all the resources that come with controlling ports, data networks, uh, shipping, etc. cetera. It, it does seem like it is creating like a... a an, it's reinforcing a class system that almost already exists. And I think we see that especially in, in Africa as they kind of come in and they, they pull resources out, they put resources and financial resources back in to those communities. And they do sometimes lift up small portions uh, kind of out of poverty or into a better situation. Yet at the same time, they're not bringing it up to necessarily standards that you would find maybe in parts of China or in the West. Um, they're still keeping them kind of at an arm's reach. And I, do you think that's intentional or is that just a level of resource allocation they don't have? I mean, what, what is the ultimate goal, do you think? I, I, I don't think that's intentional. Uh, I, you know, I don't think they're intentionally keeping anyone down in Africa and other parts of the developing world. Um, but um, it, it's sort of a feature of the way they do things where um, the, I mean, they very much deal with the elites of each country. Um, so uh, what you see uh, is what the local elites will agree to. And that is not necessarily in the interest of the, the common person in those countries. Um, there's also another part, particularly in Africa, that's kind of interesting, and that isn't government driven at all, which is a lot of the Chinese presence in Africa is actually uh, individual entrepreneurs or people who, they may have come over with a Chinese state-owned company to build a, a highway or a railroad or something, but they decide, you know, um, I'm going to try my luck here and open a restaurant or a company selling furniture. Um, and that uh, there's a bigger, uh, from uh, you know, the numbers we know, there's a, a bigger number of Chinese people engaged in this kind of uh, private sector initiative in China than there are people employed by the state-owned companies. Uh, and that's another factor, but that's not something that the government has planned. But nonetheless, it does mean that, you know, the Chinese population in Africa is growing quite rapidly and that, you know, that has consequences too. There was a, like some level of backlash, I believe, that kind of came recently from certain African nations over how African nationals were treated in China. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
uh, there, I mean, you know, frankly, there's a lot of racism in China, uh, and uh, it, particularly in Guangzhou, uh, which is the southern city just near Hong Kong, where there is the largest population of African migrants. You know, a lot of them are business people um, uh, living semi permanently. And uh, it seems at the behest of local authorities and probably, you know, just bigoted people, many of them have been evicted from their housing and f forced to sleep on the streets. Uh, you know, even a, there's been video of McDonald's not letting black people in, um, a, a lot of very nasty stuff. Um, and this has all happened over the last week, causing a bunch of African diplomats and leaders to... Um, demand an explanation from China. Um, it seems though already the elites of these countries have uh, gone back to the same old win-win uh, uh, dialogue, the, the, the story about you know, the, the mutual benefit of cooperating with China. Um, and even the African media, uh, the, the, the press has calmed down in its coverage of this. Uh, but on social media, there's still a lot of pushback and you're still seeing a lot of videos of Africans in Guangzhou being treated badly. And I think it, uh, it, it'll be interesting to see what effect it has, um, but uh, it, it won't be good for China's reputation in, in Africa, that's for sure. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I think the average uh, American or, Euro or European who uh, tends to think of China often thinks of it in very different terms um, than they, they tend to think about the problems in their own backyard. Um, yet when you hear something like that, you hear about you know, race-based evictions, that could be happening in any part of America today. It probably is happening in, in most parts of America today. Um, these stories, I think, bring something down to a more, more almost communal uh, level and understanding. Do you, do you see that though? I mean, is that kind of, is that just an isolated incident where, Hey, racism exists everywhere? Or do you see that there happens to be a lot of more micro similarities and problems between kind of Western society and interpersonal relations and Chinese society and interpersonal relations? Um, that's a good question. I mean, um, you know, it's, I think the the foundations of racism in China are quite different from, say, in the United States. Um, for most Chinese people, you know, seeing foreigners of any kind is still relatively new. You know, until the early '80s, the country was really isolated for you know uh, uh, for four or five decades. Uh, and even before that, you know, there were only certain parts of China where there were a lot of foreigners. So foreigners generally are new. Um, some prejudices, I think, are are similar, uh, you know, relating to skin color. Uh, there's a there's a there's a definitely a colorism in China, even with Chinese people themselves who can look down on darker people. Um, uh, and I think they're um, popularly um, there. There are a lot of racist notions about black people that people don't even really think of as racism because it hasn't ever been presented to them in that way. So sort of functionally, it, it, feels, it can feel very different. The government can be extremely, you know, ha is in fact extremely, um, they try as much as possible to be perceived as treating African countries and African people equally. Um, and, you know, sometimes, I mean, a friend of mine from Sierra Leone uh, that I used to, um, uh, who lived in Beijing when I was there, used to tell a story about how uh, one day he uh, was going to visit a friend. And this was way back. This was the first couple of years I was in China in the 1990s. Um, and he knocked on the wrong door. He was going to see a friend. He locked, knocked on the wrong apartment door. And this little girl answered the door and she said, Daddy, there's a foreigner here. And he suddenly felt really good because he was like, oh, I'm just a, another foreigner, just like any other foreigner, you know? Um, so it, it, it's odd. It, it doesn't, racism in China doesn't feel the same. There, there, there's much less history behind it. Uh, but in some ways it can be much cruder. Um, 
and um, there, there hasn't really been a um, any kind of movement of political correctness. I mean, that's that's a word that people use derogative, uh, you know, uh, in a negative way, but. Uh, there hasn't really been a systematic education that racism is bad in China. Um, so it's racism just like you have everywhere, but it's its own kind of Chinese kind of racism. I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, it, it is a, it, it, I think it definitely makes sense. And I think it, it's, it's a good understanding that, I mean, these are, these are universal problems the world over, but they are absolutely regionalized and very different uh, in the communities that they exist in. Um, yeah. You know, we are getting uh, kind of towards the end of the, the time limit on this program, but I do want to, to ask you the same question I kind of ask everyone, which is th through through your career uh, and, you know, your personal life as well. What is the thing that you most hope to convey to other people? What do you think is the most important takeaway you have to offer? Wow. <laughs> that's putting me on the spot. It, it's <laughs> It's that's that's why I like to do it. It's a drastic pivot for something incredibly deep, and I, I like to see what people come up with. Well, uh, I think um, in my career, I I would like people to understand that China is full of human beings, uh, many of whom are wonderful people, but that also that doesn't mean we should necessarily be supportive of the government. Uh, I, I guess my work is probably devoted towards that. And I, I think this is a country that there is a real deficit of information, at least in English. Uh, and that continues to be the case, even though it's much better than it was 10, 20 years ago. Uh, and I would like to help plug those gaps. Well, I think you guys are doing a, a great job of it. Um, I know uh, since, since I've been a subscriber, uh, I feel like I'm seeing so many different sides of China. Uh, both in a positive and sometimes negative light that uh, I might not have otherwise. Well, thank and, you, Alex. Uh, Can I ask, do you do you have a history with China? I have none personally. I mean, other than just, you know, trying to be a student of it uh, to an extent. I mean, no, no more right. than, I guess, anyone else, right? It is, yeah. um, it, you know, it seemed like it'd be a huge information gap for an individual to have to not focus on a nation that... Uh, is, you know, if, look, it affects so many people just within its own borders, much less all over the world. Yeah. No, on, absolutely. on a daily basis. And, I mean, COVID-19 is just another example of how we've got to pay attention to what's going on there. Um, I've been washing my hands like a maniac since like January 4. <laughs> and, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, how, how's this? Do do I have a personal relationship or history with China? Uh, I've never been there, but right. uh, literally all of the tools that I am using to record this show right now were manufactured there. Right. Uh, from the headphones in my ears to the microphone, um, it this is a Lenovo computer, right? Right. Uh, I mean, what I feel like, what better possible analogy? Um, yeah. in the history of Lenovo and how it relates to IBM is there for, for China and the West and this new age. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so thank you so much for coming on the show, Jeremy, please, uh, you know, stay safe and, you know, keep us informed. Likewise. Thank you it. very much, Alex. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much. All right. Deep.